Well, welcome back to Comic Book Historians. I'm Alex Grand. Go ahead and click on that juicy red subscribe button down below. Now I put together a couple of Steve Ditko, co-creator of the Marvel Universe videos. They were done in my old presentation style. And recently I put together kind of a Jack Kirby video that modernized the older Jack Kirby co-creator videos I've done. And I've been asked to do that for the Ditko one. And I think it's important I do that because Steve Ditko contributed very key things to the formation of Marvel Universe in the history of pop culture. It's not just the creation of the characters of Spider-Man and Doctor Strange. There's actually a lot more that goes into what he did and a lot of what we brought into the making of this popular brand. So let's get started. Now we all know who Stan Lee is, but who is Steve Ditko? Well, Steve Ditko is many great things, but one thing for certain, he is a co-creator and founding father of the Marvel Universe. No one really can say with certainty what was the nature of the creative discussions between him and Stan Lee, but no doubt they, with the help of Jack Kirby, came up with one of the best comic book franchises in history. As we know from the previous blog, Jack Kirby with Stan Lee created the building blocks of the Marvel Universe, but it was Steve Ditko that put an abstract twist on some key items that completed the identity of Marvel and some key characters. We'll break Steve Ditko's contribution down to five important details that rounded off Jack Kirby's building blocks into a Marvel identity that was far more complete and intriguing. These five things are the visual creation of Spider-Man, including his villains and supporting cast, in 1962, the creation of the Marvel comic cover corner box in the early 1963, the visual creation of Doctor Strange in mid-1963, the revamping of Iron Man's armor in late 1963, and the concept that anger and stress trigger Bruce Banner's transformation into the Incredible Hulk in 1964. In this image, I am showing what preceded Steve Ditko's contributions, generally from Jack Kirby, and below are Steve Ditko's rather incredible transformations, which significantly transcended the originals. According to Steve Ditko in Robin Snyder's History of Comics, Volume 1, Number 5, in 1990, Jack Kirby and Stan Lee worked on a five-page Spider-Man that Ditko was going to ink. Ditko noticed that the Kirby-Lee Spider-Man origin was like Jack Kirby and Joe Simon's The Fly, a 1959 Archie Comics character, which included the same transformative magic ring. He also mentioned that the costume was very much like other Jack Kirby costumes of the time, including costumes like Giant Man or Captain America. Here are their images from Avengers 4, 1964. He portrayed that costume in his 2002 essay, An Insider's Part of Comics History, Jack Kirby's Spider-Man, copyright by Steve Ditko. I highly recommend people contact Robin Snyder to purchase the whole essay. It is a riveting read. Steve Ditko also portrayed the difference between his and Stan Lee's contribution in the creation of the character in 1990 shown here with copyright to Steve Ditko. As we can see here, there's a big difference between the name Spider-Man and then the way the character comes out looking on the page. To put it in perspective, there are quite a few Spider-Man in comics and we'll talk about that in another episode. So this visual creation of Marvel's Spider-Man by Steve Ditko was a huge standout success and a huge jump from Jack Kirby and Joe Simon's Fly character, which is the only Kirby image we have that has any relation to the Kirby Lee Spider-Man before Steve Ditko got involved. The visual creation of Spider-Man also came with a huge rogues gallery and a supporting cast, which was highlighted in one of the best annuals to date, an Amazing Spider-Man Annual No. 1, 1964, by Steve Ditko and Stan Lee. Spider-Man was, of course, a slam dunk for Marvel, and there are other blogs that explore how much of his own life he put into Spider-Man. This visual creation was a huge contributor to Marvel's success, but his contributions continue. Ditko wrote that in 1963, he came up with the idea for the Marvel letterbox on the top left of the comic book cover and showed it to both Stan Lee and Saul Brodsky. In Fantastic Four 18, 1963, Stan Lee confirms that Steve Ditko dreamed up the idea. In 1961, Jack Kirby and Stan Lee wrote Amazing Adventures 1, 1961, and came up with the character named Dr. Droom. Droom traveled to Tibet and underwent a transformation to become a crime-fighting mystic. 
Steve Ditko inked these Kirby Lee Dr. Droom stories and a couple of years later worked with Lee on the same type of plots but took this type of character to a whole new level when he visually created Dr. Strange in 1963. Stephen Strange also travels to Tibet to become transformed into a mystic. Dr. Strange with his rogues gallery became another solid structure in the buttoning Marvel Silver Age, and to think that Steve Ditko would apply his sensibilities to this Droom type character and escalated the visual presentation to a whole other magnificent and incredible level. Check out the splash pages in Ditko's cataclysmic Dormammu vs. Eternity pages from Strange Tales 146, 1966. These pages are simply incredible. In the case of Iron Man, we spoke in the Iron Man Jack Kirby episode that he was assembled from various elements and presented in Tales of Suspense 39, 1963. It was a great comic book with the bulky tin-plated armor that became a yellow-gold color as shown in issue 45. However, when Steve Ditko got his hands on the character, he streamlined the character's armor into the red and gold design we all know today, which is significantly successful in current films. The premiere of Steve Ditko's red and yellow suit is unveiled here in Tales of Suspense 49, 1964, with the shedding of the old bulky armor. Of course, this is the armor design that helped put the Marvel film franchise on the map in 2008 with the first Iron Man film. So yes, thank you Mr. Ditko! Another in a great series of genius improvements. Steve Ditko's transformative wizardry also extends to the Incredible Hulk. When the Hulk first appeared in issue 1, 1962, he presented as a monster comic who turned his powers on or off depending on if it was night or day. He was essentially a Frankenstein werewolf hybrid type monster that only lasted about six issues. Steve Ditko did work on some issues before his cancellation, however the Hulk was brought back in Tales to Astonish with Steve Ditko again helming the character in issue 60, 1964. One key character contribution by Steve Ditko was essentially retconning the character so Bruce Banner transforms into the Hulk whenever he got angry or stressed. The trigger is so key to the character now that no one can really think of the character in any other way, as shown in this meme with a line from the Incredible Hulk TV show of the late 1970s, as well as an image from the Hulk from the 2008 Incredible Hulk film by Marvel Studios. This sense of nervous anxiety of when the stress will come to trigger a transformation puts the Hulk into the unpredictable mobile bomb category that adds much more entertaining uncertainty to his story. And that was yet another fantastic contribution by Steve Ditko. Here is Steve Ditko in his self-portrait in a backup feature of him in Amazing Spider-Man Annual 1, 1964, clearly showing that all jokes aside, he was hard at work expanding, improving, and creating in the 1960s. One of his most notorious villains was the CEO and director of the board, Norman Osborn, who first appeared with his cornrow haircut in Amazing Spider-Man 23 in 1965 as an unnamed character in the background. We didn't know he was going to be the Green Goblin yet. And he was fully named in Amazing Spider-Man 37, 1966. He and his haircut both have a Steve Ditko Charlton Comics precursor in Strange Suspense Stories 33, 1957 in, quote-unquote, Director of the Board. Now on to the next villain, the name Electro was used in Atlas and Timely Comics, which later became Marvel. And we talked about this in the Atlas Precursor episodes. However, Ditko also worked on an electrically powered character in Strange Suspense Stories 49, 1960, before co-creating Electro in 1964 in Amazing Spider-Man 9. There is also a fairly strong chameleon precursor by Steve Ditko for Charlton Comics Out of This World 7, 1957, where a spy is seen using various masks to accomplish espionage. The same ability and spy origin is used for the chameleon in Amazing Spider-Man 1, 1963. Spider-Man was of course a slam dunk for Marvel, and there are other blogs and books that explore how much of his own life he puts into Spider-Man and Peter Parker. This visual creation was a huge contributor to Marvel's success, but his contributions continue. In the world of Mutation, he did a mutant story with Stanley in Amazing Adult Fantasy 14, July 1962, where a young boy is called a mutant freak, and he flies, being contacted by a telepath to come join in a faraway safe haven for other mutants. 
it's easy to imagine where this character went, right? Because we see the same concept play out in Uncanny X-Men 1, 1963. However, we know from the Jack Kirby co-creator episode, Kirby himself worked on mutant books in the early 1940s as well as the 1950s. But it deserves mention that Ditko did the above with Stan, so it's no coincidence that the mutants all meet up with a telepath at a safe haven in both Amazing Fantasy 14 1962 and X-Men 1 1963. Well, it's important to go even more into the past from this Amazing Fantasy 14 issue. Steve Ditko himself has mutant precursors from the late 1950s during his time at Charlton Comics. So it doesn't stop there. Steve Ditko had a pre-Marvel mutant story in Charlton's This Magazine is Haunted 14, 1957. The Silver Age had some interesting sci-fi explanations for a lot of its stories, and one takes place here for Mutation, where man is born with chlorophyll cells instead of hemoglobin for blood, as a plant man. This script is currently uncredited, but it is a mutant sighting. In Out of This World 7, 1958, Steve Ditko pencils a story for Charlton where radiation mutates a man from a war that utilized atomic fission, and the man questions why he was ever born in a script attributed to Joe Gill. So these are classic X-Men self-hating hangups. There was an issue Ditko did a couple months before with an uncredited script for Space War 10 1961, where in true Silver Age style, radiation transcends a human into the supernormal category. The year before 1957, Out of This World number 3, Steve Ditko pencils a story called The Supermen for Charlton, scripted by Jack Olick, where radiation mutates men's brains, giving them telepathic powers. Radiation augmenting a human being is the same thing that Ditko depicts with Peter Parker when he gains the power of a radioactive spider becoming the Amazing Spider-Man in Amazing Fantasy 15, 1962. Now on to the topic of magic in the Comic Reader 16, 1963, Stanley writes in a promotional letter, we have a new character, Doctor Strange, Twas Steve's idea. But regardless, as far as visual execution of the story panels, Doctor Strange was Steve's baby. And Doctor Strange would use his hands to cast teleportation spells, which Ditko did years earlier with a prior character in 1959 for Charlton Comics Space Adventures 27. When Ditko penciled and plotted Doctor Strange in the early 1960s, he would employ Doctor Strange utilizing his hands to engage in transportation and various other powers. Out of This World number 7, 1958, has a story credited to Joe Gill with art by Steve Ditko, where a man finds an artifact that can transport him in a swirl of visual effects into any time and any place. Steve Ditko would bring this concept of a device helping trans space-time transport with Doctor Strange's Eye of Agamotto in the 1960s as well. Check out his work before Marvel in 1957 Strange Suspense Stories number 27 for Charlton Comics of his art of dimension traveling. Steve Ditko would also take this concept into the next level in the 1960s with Doctor Strange who routinely traveled dimensions in a similar but more visually stunning level. What these examples show is that Steve was toying with the ideas of mutation, sorcery, artifacts of power, and Spider-Man villain type super abilities years before he came onto Marvel, which suggests that he brought those ideas with him in co-creating what we know as the Marvel Universe. Take care everybody. Don't forget to click on the subscribe button. We got more to say in other videos. Also check out our podcast available on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, and Google Play. We also have constant updates on Twitter and Instagram. Or continue the conversation in our Facebook group. Cheers.